with where we started um, was about in the spring of 2015 when I filled out a survey describing the type of survivorship care we provided at our community cancer center. And from that survey, offered um, an opportunity to participate in a research model with evaluating cancer survivorship models through the comparative effectiveness research that they were doing. Um, I'm sorry, this is Hema from GW. Hi, Gemma. Arlene, did you already start? I was I was just starting an introduction. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You were on mute, and I don't think the speakers could hear you. So, um, and we just started the recording. If you don't mind just starting uh, over again. Sure, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Arlene O'Rourke, and I'm a nurse practitioner at New England Cancer Specialist in uh, Scarborough, Maine. And um, we are going to be talking about survivorship care models today that we're using in our community cancer center in conjunction uh, working with a big academic center of Tufts Medical Center in Boston. And we first came together with George Washington University when I was uh, filling out a survey in how we provide cancer survivorship care at New England Cancer Specialist. And from that survey was offered an opportunity to participate in evaluating cancer survivorship models a three-year research project that George Washington University was uh, using and funded by the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute in a comparative effectiveness research plan. Um, we were able to participate in that in the fall of 2015 to April of 2016 and enrolled 87 patients and uh, 83 breast patients, four colon patients, and even since the time of completing the survivorship care model of that research, the, um, the work that we've done to create phase-specific cancer survivorship care plans has progressed, and we're here to talk about that today. And here I'm going to have Tracy Weisberg talk some more about that. Good afternoon, and thank you for um, inviting us into your lunch hour today. Uh, my name is Tracy Weisberg. I'm a medical oncologist um, working here at New England Cancer Specialist for many years. And um, this webinar is, um, is a wonderful thing to put together, and we're so happy to um, be working on it with Tufts Medical Center. Um, Tufts is, um, uh, is a hospital and a university. It has a... Um, a medical school, I mean, it's a uh, you know, full academic program, but in Maine, we're a little unique here. We don't have an allopathic medical school, and so there are a number of seats each year in the Tufts Medical School that are dedicated to Maine students. Um, and that's where the initial relationship has come forth, um, resulting in this webinar. Then um, the vision of the director of the chief of um, medical oncology, Dr. Andy Evans, um, really reaching out um, as he um, looked at his vision of cancer care in the region and um, wanting to very much help empower um, community oncology in the region. And this survivorship program that we've been working on has been a direct result of those um, two associations. Um, so having said that, I'd like to turn the discussion over to Dr. Parsons, who's going to do the front end of this presentation, and then I'll be back to tell you about some of the specific things that we've implemented with some um, care plans here in Portland, Maine. Thanks, Tracy. This is Susan Parsons, and I also want to thank you all for joining today's webinar. I am a pediatric oncologist by training, and I'm the director of survivorship um, at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. As Tracy mentioned, we've had the opportunity to collaborate on the uh, development and implementation of survivorship care planning, um, which has really been an academic community partnership. I think we've both uh, both groups have gained tremendously from this partnership, um, both in thinking about how to scale our evidence-based approach to a very busy uh, clinical practice, and also how uh, we can learn from the community practice 
in terms of practice efficiencies um, and really leverage the power of the electronic health record. What I'd like to do today is to um, begin our discussion by um, going through some of the overall mandates for survivorship care plan and then turn it over to my colleague on Nadine Lindendahl, who will talk about how we began this process at the Academic Medical Center. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> So as I said, I'd like to start by describing the content and the process of care planning, how we developed it, and importantly, also how we implemented it at both practice settings. As many of you know, the number of cancer survivors in the United States continues to grow. This is actually a testament to the remarkable improvements in the detection and treatment of cancer patients um, across the entire age continuum. It's been very um, exciting for those of us who've been in oncology for a long time to see these improvements and now uh, be able to really pause and uh, reflect on the fact that there are more than 15 million cancer survivors in the U.S. This number is anticipated to grow to more than 20 million um, by 2026. Over the past 10 years, a number of mandates have been put forth, as summarized on this slide, to improve the quality of care that we are giving to our survivors. Uh, this began with um, a very important report from the Institute of Medicine in 2006 entitled Lost in Transition, where many, many of the gaps in our survivorship care as patients moved from active treatment to uh, follow-up care really uh, were made evident. In 2012, the American College of Surgeons, through its Commission on Cancer, mandated that all survivors be provided with a comprehensive care summary and a follow-up plan that was clearly and effectively explained. This was echoed by the, uh, in the following year by the Institute of Medicine report that said that this system is in fact in crisis and more um, specifics about how to deliver care planning is really needed. Survivorship care, um, as outlined by the Institute of Medicine, includes four important components. These include surveillance of the underlying cancer or the emergence of new cancers. It includes intervention to look at sequelae of the cancer itself and its treatment. And this is principally uh, referred to as late effect surveillance and some of the major uh, topics that we've been thinking about um, are summarized here, including cardiac issues, neurocognitive issues, uh, sexual issues, um, emotional response, and then um, other end organ damage as well. The care plan also includes a focus on um, cancer prevention and early detection. Uh, both of new cancers and recurrent cancers, and emphasizes healthy lifestyle. This includes healthy diet, exercise, smoking cessation, sun protection, et cetera. And then the biggest issue, or the issue that's been quite challenging to implement, is full coordination among the specialists, subspecialists, and primary care providers who are involved in the patient's care to ensure that all of the survivor's health needs are met in a resource responsible way. And by that I mean um, preventing under testing and over testing. In response to the initial uh, 2012 mandate of uh, full survivorship care planning for all, 
a survey was conducted which looked at the readiness of accredited pro uh, programs to respond to this mandate. What they found was that only 20% of respondents indicated that a survivorship care plan process had been developed, even though that implementation was supposed to be fully rolled out by 2015. 60% of the respondents reported needing information about how to do care planning, identify who should do care planning, and further details about when that care planning should be conducted. As a result of this survey and the, I think, the confusion that uh, became evident across the country, the Commission on Cancer revised its mandate so that we have a gradual uh, rollout of this um, compliance of, of um, survivorship care planning over the time period from 2015 to 2019. As you can see, we're now entering um, a point where we should have follow-up care plans for approximately 50% of our patients who are receiving therapy of curative intent. That's still pretty daunting, but by the beginning of 2019, we need to be at 100%. Survivorship care planning, um, as summarized by the Institute of Medicine, um, as I said, includes a summary of treatment, information on recommended follow-up activity, as well as risk reduction and health promotion activity. So that's a, a very important, comprehensive way to consider survivorship care. And the bottom line and what we've learned in the course of doing this here is that specialized knowledge is needed to address survivorship care. I'm going to now turn this over to Nadine Lindendahl, who's going to describe for you how we've conducted this at TOPS. Thank you. So my name is Nadine, and I'm an oncology nurse practitioner, and I'm very happy to be here and be part of this discussion. So I think that we can all agree that survivorship is very important from a philosophical perspective and also from a national requirements perspective. But for myself as a nurse practitioner who cares for patients in a clinic, my goal is really to understand how we translate this and make it practical in a real world setting. So what we have really been working on together is the implementation of survivorship and to streamline, in it, streamline it in a way that it applies in a real life clinic setting. So one of the first things that we began to think about at Tufts was the process, the best process to transition patients. So this slide shows a more traditional trajectory of the way that this has been done. So patients were followed by their medical oncologist and then got to a particular point in their treatment, either at the end of treatment or at the five-year mark, and then they were transitioned either to their primary care provider or, if they were lucky, to a survivorship program. And this is illustrated in the slide at the five-year the five mark with the stop sign. And I, I think this approach uh, was problematic, particularly for the patient, because they felt a sense of a, a steep drop-off, almost like falling off a cliff, and it, it, it was traumatizing for them. And I know as a nurse practitioner who cares for patients on active treatment, when you're seeing them, you're seeing them frequently and developing, developing a, a relationship of trust and security over time and you get to know each other and have a shared story and a shared history. So losing that relationship can be really traumatic for patients. And also on the flip side, uh, we as providers, medical oncology providers, also become extremely connected to our patients and it's hard for us to let go. So I think in this world of medical oncology where patient care is getting more and more complex, from my own practice, how can we balance caring for the newly diagnosed and the, those that we're actively treating and also care for survivors? 
And I think in real life that this is really hard to do. Um, I think that the newly diagnosed patients and the active treatment patients just naturally begin to take precedence. So I think this is why we realize the importance of having a separate survivorship program. So the next slide illustrates how we're trying to change this old model, this falling off a cliff model, with a more general phase in to survivorship. So during the first year out of treatment, when patients are still having surveillance scanning, their CT scans, their MRIs with their medical oncologists, this is when we like to initiate our initial visit in survivorship to start being part of their care and to oversee the umbrella of survivorship that's informed by our detailed treatment summary and our care plans. So in this slide, there are arbitrary dates that, that we identified, and it's different for each practice and each disease group. But what we're suggesting is that around the five-year mark, when patients are no longer requiring surveillance scans, if that's pertinent to their disease type, they would phase out from seeing their medical oncologist and be ready, be ready to be followed solely in the survivorship clinic. So we think this gentle transition is better for everyone, for patients and providers. So moving on to talk about survivorship care, and it's important to understand that it has two components, which I'll discuss both. The first is a treatment summary, and the second is a specific care plan. So these are both important documents. But it's really important to keep in mind that they're not done just one moment in time, but they're actually living documents that change over time. So in regard to treatment summaries, there are actually a lot of different summaries, uh, treatment summary templates that are available. At Tufts, we have two separate survivorship clinics. One, we follow adolescents and young adults. This is our AYA program. And we also have a second survivorship clinic that focuses solely on older adults. So in our AYA program with the adolescent and young adults, these are patients that were treated as children with four pediatric cancers and have now aged out of pediatric care. In this clinic, we use the treatment summary. It's called Passports for Care. So this is a web-based program and it was actually developed by pediatric oncologists. And this slide shows an actual example of a treatment summary and the way that it's set up. So on the left side of the slide, you see this big uh, stack of charts. So this is part of my, my real life. <laughs> so that when new patients are referred to us, one of the first steps is to create this treatment summary. And when you're seeing these young adults that were treated as children, this was in an age where there was no medical record and it was all paper charts. So the process is literally to go through these, these charts that come in on a forklift page by page and to summarize the treatment that the patient had, including their surgery, their radiation, and the specific doses of chemotherapy that they received. So in our other clinic that focuses solely on, on the older adults, we actually use the ASCO templates for the treatment summary. And there are ASCO templates that are available for specific disease types. We do sometimes make modifications to these summaries, just how it makes best sense for our practice. And on this slide is a sample care plan of the ASCO treatment summary for breast cancer. And one of the most important things in the treatment sum summary is to identify the, the total, the cumulative dose of chemotherapy treatment, because that becomes very important in the risk factors going forward after treatment is complete. So the first step um, is doing the treatment summary, and then the next step is moving on to look at the guidelines. So this is a summary slide of the guidelines that we use to shape our care plans. And so these include the COGs, the NCCN guidelines, the CDC guidelines. 
So I, I think one really important thing about this, which I had not realized prior to doing this work, is that it, it's actually very common that these guidelines can disagree and can put forward different recommendations. So we could actually give a whole separate topic or a whole separate presentation just on this topic because it can be so complex. But what we've learned to do in our practice is when there is disagreement in the guidelines and we're not sure, we're not clear on what we should put in the care plan, that we will refer to our colleagues who are specialists. So for example, we find that there's two common areas of disagreement are often in breast health and in cardiology. So if, we're, if we have questions regarding a patient, when to start their mammogram or their breast MRI, then we'll refer them to a specific medical oncologist, breast medical oncologist. And if we're also not sure how often a patient should have echoes done, then we have a designated cardio-oncologist that we'll send them to, to help resolve those conflicts and have a, a clear sense of what their plan should be. So just to recap, we, we discussed doing the treatment summary and then going to the guidelines. And then the third step is actually to formulate the actual survivorship care plan. So as tough, this has, we've really gone through an evolution through this process. Initially, when we were seeing patients, we were writing the, the care plan essentially in a paragraph form in the assessment and plan in the note. But we were finding that this was very cumbersome and every time we were seeing the patient, we were kind of reinventing the wheel because we were having to go back to the treatment summary and the guidelines. So in retrospect, this, this now seems pretty obvious, but we developed this, this this format, which is much more user-friendly, and this is demonstrated in the slide, we use this chart-like format that we developed at Tufts, and you can see the column on the left. What we do is we address the body system, the test, the reason why we're doing the test, how often, when it was done, and who's responsible for, for the test or the care. So it's important to point out that the entire care plan, the treatment summary, and this care plan we make available to our patient to provide education to them on the treatment that they had and the reason why they're doing the testing and having the appointments that they are in the care plan. We also provide it, we embed it in our notes so that each provider that's involved with their care also has a copy and understands, again, why we're doing it, but also in this chaotic world of medicine, who's responsible for what. So again, this has evolved through our practice. So we went from writing it all out to getting it more into a structured format. But then what we found is we were doing an individual care plan for each patient, which was very time consuming. So the next evolution was developing to streamline with developing specific generic care plans according to disease type that could be then tailored to each patient. And that's where I want to segue now to the portion of Dr. Weisberg's talk on breast, breast health care plans. So I'm going to um, move on and discuss um, the breast cancer specific survivorship care plans that we've been working on in our um, community oncology practice. Um, New England Cancer Specialists is a large um, community oncology practice in southern Maine. We see about 3,200 new patients a year and about 49,000 patient visits a year. And um, we are blessed with having um, a lot of long-term continuity with our patients and even have had the honor of um, taking care of mothers, daughters, fathers, grandfathers, um, a fairly stagnant patient population here in Maine. 
Um, and we are um, a large physician-owned um, practice, and we've uh, become experts at um, making our electronic medical record um, work as best as possible to achieve um, the goals of patient-centered care and also getting uh, documentation down. And we've become intensely interested in cancer survivorship um, starting about six years ago when um, our hospital, Maine Medical Center, um, was accredited as a National Association of Breast Centers. And one of the SARS, of course, in that is um, to create cancer treatment summaries and survivorship care. And um, Maine Medical Center, as well as other hospitals we work at, are commissioned on cancer certified. certified. And so they have deliverables with regard to survivorship care as well. And now New England Cancer Specialist is one of 197 oncology care model practices, the OCM, across the United States. And survivorship care um, is a big component of that value-based system. So we have um, had to work hard to um, be efficient and leverage our technology in order to capture this data. And this is not new information that I have up on the screen, um, but we've created our care plans to be a hybrid of um, NCCN guidelines as well as ASCO guidelines. Um, and we've looked at Livestrong and a couple other models as we have um, started to develop what we are going to do in our electronic record. So as we move forward and look at value-based care and true quality cancer care, it became apparent to me as a breast cancer physician that there's a big opportunity in survivorship care to really um, coordinate care that may be happening years after the cancer diagnosis. And in our practice, we have patients who continue to want to come see us um, even beyond 10 years because they, they express that their primary care physician maybe doesn't have time or a lack of focus on their cancer care survivorship and needs. Um, in breast cancer, certainly adjuvant therapy in many individuals might be extended beyond five years, certainly, and in some cases now legitimately beyond 10 years. And so management of symptoms related to therapy is critical to maintaining a normal quality of life. And also I think it's incumbent upon the oncology team to make sure that the patient is um, managed appropriately and that just because they're on an adjuvant treatment long term, that they're not getting uh, too much um, diagnostic testing or too little. Um, also, cancer predisposition testing and recommendation and follow-ups is an ever-changing field, and that's an important component in updating a patient's survivorship care plan going forward. Are they candidates for additional gene testing? Would that modify their survivorship care plan? Should they be getting additional studies? Are there additional individuals in the family who maybe are at risk? So um, we use um, Onco EMR, and um, what we have done is we've created a variety of different note templates that are evidence-based. And so people can, um, people in the practice will select the template that's appropriate for the type of visit that they are seeing for the patient. And so um, for routine visits, they may be seeing um, just a regular visit note. If they're getting a palliative care consult, they have, we have a template for that. And down on the bottom, we have all of our different survivorship templates. Um, in our practice right now, our advanced care providers are meeting with the patients to do their initial survivorship care plan, and we hope to extend these um, time-specific survivorship care plans to another acti activity that our advanced care providers will help us execute. So our initial survivorship care plan looks much like um, other care plans that Nadine has demonstrated, ASCO, 
um, live strong, et cetera. The difference is, is that we try as best we can um, to groom our physicians that on day one, as they're starting to see this patient, that they create a summary um, on the initial note that gives key dates, pathologies, treatments, so that when the advanced care provider goes into the electronic record to create the care plan, they're not starting from that big stack of papers that Nadine showed, but rather already a distilled down clinical treatment summary of what has transpired, key dates with regards to diagnosis, imaging, genetic testing results, et cetera. Uh-oh. I'm stuck here, sorry. Okay, great. So as we were working with our colleagues at Tufts, um, we started to create a five-year survivorship care plan. This would be a plan that is executed somewhere between year 4.5 and 6 of breast cancer follow-up visits and survivorship care. And things that we thought were important to have on this care plan is, is a patient, has they been on a clinical trial? Yes or no. Some of our patients have been on a couple of clinical trials, one of which being um, the survivorship care um, trial that really has um, initiated this webinar with GW. Um, their treatment, their initial stage, their um, biomarker status, their therapy, their local therapy, all of the important things that you see here, all embedded in our electronic record. And hopefully many of these fields are already auto-populated and our advanced care provider would then just merely need to make sure that things are correct and update um, going on to the second page of the care plan, any specific things that need to be addressed late with regard to chemotherapy toxicities, radiation they may have received, um, counseling or studies that they may be on with regard to healthy lifestyles and risk reduction, and then cancer screening um, for other cancers as well as their unique breast cancer follow-up guidelines. Um, we look forward to launching this program. I've um, used this survivorship care um, plan now in about 10 patients. We have a similar um, care plan for patients who are 10 plus years out. And our hope is that by having these set, um, more in-depth, meaningful discussions at those time points, that we can kind of reset, regroup, reestablish what the important parameters are for our longer-term survivors, have a really good tool for communicating to primary care physicians um, about what it is they need to be doing to help, um, uh, help support our cancer survivors, and also, um, you know, the hope that through better communication, we're not going to have duplication of laboratory testing, imaging, et cetera. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn the discussion over to Arlene, who's going to talk about our survivorship care plans in head and neck cancer. Thank you. So I'm Arlene O'Rourke, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I work in clinic every day and have a good population of head and neck patients. And as you know, the coordination of care for this population is complex. And, and yeah, so um, the survivorship trajectory of care for each individual cancer diagnosis is complex, comprehensive, and so specific to that disease and treatment. The survivorship care plans are also going to reflect those um, individual components of each diagnosis and treatment.
Our head and neck survivorship care plans try to begin at the time of diagnosis. We decided to work with the HPV positive patient population for curative intent in the survivorship group. Uh, again, it's multidisciplinary and using our TUMA board to reflect what kind of coordination of care is going to be required in our head and neck plan. I think navigation is one of the biggest components with our head and neck population to try to coordinate that care well. And so at TUMA board, trying to identify who the particular physicians will be in that patient's plan of care. And again, their treatments are, you know, set six to seven weeks long, but so intense and coordination is the key between radiation and weekly chemotherapies that knowing the players are really important. Trying to work with patients to develop some prehab with their nutritional intake, their um, smoking and alcohol cessation, and dental work as well. So in navigation, trying to coordinate who those people will be that are working with them in that. When we begin our treatment, we start with a chemotherapy education component. And here is where we provide a lot of this information for the patient and begin the tobacco and alcohol cessation counseling. We do the distress scale up front to find out where their level of anxiety is at the onset of treatment so that we can work with them through the course of it and afterwards as well. Our patient population here at New England Cancer Specialists between the year of 2010 and 2015 included 119 patients. 66% of those were HPV positive. Um, 51, uh, 51 patients of the oropharyngeal and 38 glossal. And again, the male to female ratio is quite large with usually three times the amount of men to women. The survival, five-year survival rate of all stages of head and neck cancer is about 63%, with 83% at the local level. So long-term long care survivorship care is very important. Um, in Maine, we had about 200 cases in 2009 and about 236 in 2012. Mortality overall, in Maine, was 57 deaths were male and 11 were female in 2012. HPV is about 25% of oral cancers and 35% oral pharyngeal cancer. So that's what we're usually working with for our patient population. When we look at the MCC survivorship guidelines in and of themselves, trying to capture each component of this in the, in the survivorship care plan begins even again at the beginning of treatment in the chemotherapy education um, visit with the patient. When we look at the NCCN survivorship for head and neck, this is the follow-up planning that we coordinate with. Um, I think the first year when we see them every one to three months is where we're really doing most of our survivorship care. And the usual survivorship care model may be they see the advanced practice provider for their survivorship care plan and guidelines for follow-up, and then maybe transition back to the medical oncologist or do alternating visits between the medical oncologist and the survivorship visit. Um, here we're doing mostly survivorship visits for each one of those visits afterwards. Our first survivorship visit for the head and neck patient population occurs after their first restaging PET scan about three months after the completion of treatment. So that first three months after completion is really um, putting back the pieces of nutrition and working with Trismus and all of the effects of treatment in that three month period of time. Here we try to figure out how often they're gonna be seeing their um, ENT physician, continued dental evaluations and fitting for new dentures or bridges, the things that um, they're going to need to improve their nutrition at completion of treatment. And again, do another depression screening with our distress scale. This is what the um, sample survivorship care plan looks like in our EMR. Um, and here you're going to see the kinds of things that we do in usual follow-up for survivorship care. Our lab work that's going to be done, such as the thyroid, um, CNS evaluations, um, 
the carotid stenosis evaluations, dental exams, uh, barium swallows, and things like that. So as we move forward and following our head and neck patients, it really is not a one-time survivorship visit. It, it's a it's constant follow-up to their nutritional status, their oral cavity, um, their mental health. Head and neck cancers are so isolating, and the biggest reason that for that is the social ability of eating out together, eating with family at the table, and the functional changes that occur from that. And their distress levels are quite high associated with depression because of that loss of uh, eating enjoyment and socializing with family while eating and being able to go out to eat. So when we implement this survivorship care plan for the head and neck patient, it occurs again after that first PET scan at completion of treatment. We look at the program specifics and who they're going to need to follow in tobacco cessation, um, managing the depression and anxiety, nutritional statuses, and determining the frequency of follow-up in survivorship care. We use a lot of our um, resources in the community, community for tobacco cessation, speech pathology, um, physical therapy, and um, other resources to help improve the quality of their lives. And here is, by putting these pieces together, we are going to accomplish 13 of the Institute of Medicine's care management components for the COC. And now we're going to move into some next steps and thoughts that we're going to be working on in the future for our survivorship care plan with Susan. I think our next steps that we would want to share um, have to do with a continued rollout of different disease groups. I think we've learned a lot together in the development of uh, this care planning process for breast care and for um, head and neck, as uh, Tracy and Arlene have outlined. We've done similar templates and, and, and interactions with providers of patients with uh, caring for patients with Hodgkin's and uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And our uh, next big disease rollout will be also in the area of colorectal cancer. Um, we have a formal evaluation grant under review at this time to look at uh, the experience of our survivors receiving this kind of care planning um, at both Tufts Medical Center and at, um, in Maine, and we are hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to formally evaluate what aspects of this program are working for the patient and for the provider. And how we can make these uh, patients, help them provide the best care for these patients and help them with their ultimate transitioning to uh, primary, primary care provide. Tracy or Arlene, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that, um, you know, that that's definitely our vision to create meaningful documents that are um, not just there to um, fulfill a requirement, but really um, keep us focused on patient-centered care and making sure they are getting the right components of care that um, keep them safe and address their issues going forward. Um, having you know this type of touchdown document at different key points in a cancer survivor or cancer victor's um, journey, I think, is, is compelling because medical knowledge evolves and changes, and there are things that we might want to make sure that we transmit to our cancer survivors that we don't know on the first day of their survivorship, but become a parent three to four years later. Um, and, and I think it really is incumbent upon us as medical oncologists and as, you know, survivorship clinics, the primary care um, physicians are really looking to us to direct this type of activity for them. Um, 
they're they're always a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, the feedback I get is that when a patient sees them, are they doing too much? Are they doing too little? Are they, you know, they want to do what's right for the patient. And so if we give them an update roadmap, so to speak, I, I, I'm thinking that this is going to be very valuable. I'm noticing that there's um, a lot of questions coming in um, on the chat site, and we have a few minutes. I'm wondering if we could get some guidance about the best way to address these. Some of them look like they would be fairly lengthy topics. Hi, Arlene. This is um, Hema from GW. I think maybe we could address the ones that you think are we could fit in with the remaining of time that we have, and then some of the ones that um, you think are lengthier. Perhaps we could follow up with um, maybe a Q&A document afterwards and we can help, you know, put that together and share that with the slides on our, on our website. How about that? Yeah. Do you, do you want to pick those out or do you want Suzanne and I to do that? I think you can pick those out since you guys know the content, uh, your content best. Well, so one that here is, um, would you please speak to how psychosocial needs are identified and addressed? So at least in our practice, when a patient is registered for their visit, be it a treatment visit, um, a checkup, a survivorship visit, chemotherapy teaching, et cetera, um, we do a patient distress, distress score as well as a pain score, and we're going to start doing a, um, a food insecurity score. Um, and um, we have thresholds. Um, on each of those scores for um, for addressing those issues on an individual visit. So um, these are done privately by the patients. Um, we hope to have it done electronically through an iPad that ultimately will pop into our record. Right now they're being done on sheets of paper and then these are logged into the electronic record by the medical assistant who's greeting the patient, taking the vital signs, generating, you know, initial conversation, updating med list, et cetera, and then um, targeting those areas for the physician or the advanced care provider who then enters the room. I, I had also responded um, to what our practice at Tufts Medical Center is, which um, is similar in the areas of pain, fatigue, um, in, in the area of uh, psychosocial well-being, we are doing um, point-of-care quality-of-life assessment as part of our clinic visit. And what that means is that patients complete a, um, a global quality-of-life measure. We're using the 10-item PROMISE scale of global health, which gives us a subscale score for mental health and for physical health. It takes the participant approximately one to two minutes to complete this screener, and then it takes our uh, clinic staff approximately the same amount of time to produce a graphic which shows how the patient is scoring on today's visit compared to previous visits or in comparison to population norms. This serves as an important part of the dialogue at the visit we ask the patient um, to tell us a little bit more about what's been going on and why they believe that they scored the way they did, um, what kind of interventions they're already getting, or what kinds of interventions might be helpful to address specific changes in psychosocial or physical well-being. We've used this information to refer patients to psychiatry, um, and to psychology uh, for counseling support. We've also used it to refer patients to rehabilitation um, to, in terms of physical therapy and other more holistic uh, approaches to their physical well-being. So this is a, a program that is, has been really satisfying in its implementation because it's been really seamless. I'm going to mute us so you don't all get drowned out. 
Um, I, I could also um, take on, there was a comment here, limited resources in a community hospital, technology costs, HR labor, et cetera. Um, and I, I totally and completely feel your pain. Um, one thing, and, and believe me, we're far from perfect here, is that I think survivorship care is a practice responsibility. And um, along the way, as we're creating documents in the electronic record, whenever a meaningful um, event happens in this patient's care, um, documenting it in the treatment summary, and in our electronic record, we've just decided as a group that the box that's called HPI, History of Present Illness, is where we as a practice log in the treatment summary. So in essence, when it comes time to create this care plan, the advanced care providers, um, their work is cut back by about 30%, because hopefully they have some of the very important nuts and bolts right there. Also, um, we've created a lot of templates in our electronic record. Um, that allow the um, creators of the care plan to just cut and paste um, the uh, uh, recommendations so they're not constantly um, dictating or typing. They have to read it carefully and make sure they modify it and make it patient appropriate. Um, but we have a number of such templates. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we are very lucky here, but we, we work as uh, um, many different individual physician practices all under one roof. And um, I, it, working together so that it isn't just one person taking on survivorship, I think, is really the answer to that somewhat. Um, but it is a struggle, and it something that hopefully the oncology care model will address and recognize that there needs to be um, there needs to be financial compensation in the in the payment model to support these activities that are very meaningful, useful to the patient, um, useful to primary care, because you're right, they aren't compensated appropriately in our current fee for service model. I'd also like to address the question that was raised about um, more of the accounting of cases, um, and that is that uh, the, the question we have is uh, how to calculate the yearly totals to ensure the Commission on Cancer requirements are met. This is actually a non-trivial question. Um, we have found, we've been working very closely with our tumor registrar to help us know um, when patients are diagnosed and figure out when they would then be eligible for their uh, survivorship care planning. We have about a six-month lag in our uh, tumor registry information, so we feel like we're always a little bit behind the eight ball. We've recently changed our practice, and I think this mirrors more what, what Tracy has taught us, um, to actually include in the original order set, in the original treatment order set, that the patient will need survivorship care planning um, at the end of, of initial treatment. Um, the, the mandate is that the care planning be completed within th three months of the completion of initial therapy. Um, so therefore, it's now tied to when the original orders are, are um, delivered. Whether that a patient diagnosed in 15 counts for 15 or they count for 16, uh, we've been a little bit vague about that because we have focused more on getting the survivorship care plans done and delivered in a responsible way to the patient and, um, and to the rest of the care team. So I would say they may be a 2015 diagnosis, but we might count them in 2016 once we've delivered the care plan. Uh, Tracy, what, do you have any other comments about that point? 
Um, I think you made some great points, Suzanne. And just, you know, one way we get compliance here, I, I would have to defer to my tumor registry um, people at the hospital to give me those numbers about how many I need to meet the hospital compliance. But all I know is what I'm capable of doing on my side, and that's capturing as many patients as I can to make sure they have these visits and these treatment summaries created. So the way we've done that is it's a, in the drop-down order set um, that patient, that physicians and advanced care providers see in the electronic record. And our next, um, our next goal is to actually incorporate them in some of the adjuvant treatment pathways so that it, it auto-populates into the flow sheet that, you know, a care a survivorship visit needs to happen, you know, within a certain number of weeks or months of completing definitive curative therapy. Um, so that's, that's an enhancement that we're going to try to get our IT people to work on. But for now, the, the drop-down and having it in the order pick list, and the physicians are very trainable about this. They know when they're ordering their last cycle of chemotherapy, um, setting that patient up in breast cancer for radiation, and then boom, survivorship care visit. And, and I think we've been able to um, capture more patients that way by having a definite order for it. Okay, the other thing that we've done in our electronic medical record is to use some of the features like the alert feature, the, um, where we originally had included um, things like allergies, um, but now we're including whether or not they are uh, in need of the survivorship care plan, and um, and then the other category that we've put in that box is um, alerts about whether or not they're receiving navigation services. So I think that the whole point of this discussion really is to be creative and use the electronic medical record um, to help you in this process. And that it. Um, and, and to be somewhat flexible. I mean, we, I feel like Nadine and I have over the past couple of years invented, reinvented, and then reinvented again what our process was going to look like to make it doable, um, to make it scalable, um, but also to fundamentally meet the mandate, which is to provide patients with quality information that helps them go forth in their lives. Um, that, that we aren't getting sort of hung up in the box checking and the, you know, meeting the numerical benchmarks, but that we're really meeting the spirit of these recommendations from the Institute of Medicine, which is really helping patients in the transition from active treatment to survivorship care. Yeah, well said. So um, there's there's several other very good questions here, but I think perhaps um, given our time limit right now, that maybe um, maybe we could create a follow up document for the participants. Yeah, that sounds terrific. Um, this is Sarah Raskin and the whole team over at the GSU, um, the Institute for um, Patient Centered Initiatives and Health Equity, the GSU Cancer Center, and our team from the Milton Institute School of Public Health at GW. And um, we are just so um, grateful uh, to, uh, to all the presenters today and to our um, enormous audience who asked great questions. We will definitely be following up with a couple of things. Um, one will be um, the, the question and answer um, series that we have just been referring to. Um, we also um, will follow up. A couple of you have asked questions that address um, the processes of survivor care planning, and we actually um, have a provider survey right now where we're trying to um, better understand how uh, survivor care plans are accomplished and the, and the handoffs and the various processes. So we will share that survey so those of you who do that, you can um, participate. Um, we will also share links to our dissemination mechanism, the generation and translation of evidence um, uh, web portal where some other practices have posted 
um, their own approaches to doing survivorship care plans and other things, um, some of whom import from um, electronic health records, which I know has been a major question today. Um, and lastly, on behalf of the whole team, I just want to, again, thank um, everyone who uh, presented today. I, I would like to brag a bit to our audience and say that um, New England Cancer Specialist was um, a real rock star participant in our comparative effectiveness research on survivorship models of care. Um, they were just a delightful partner and um, we're so grateful that they shared their significant knowledge. Um, please feel free to reach out to us um, at the Cancer Center at GW um, with follow-up questions or comments and we will do our best to um, get the variety of teams to respond to them. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Wow. Thanks so much, Tracy. It's so great.